Let me read to you a passage from the 12th chapter of St. Mark's Gospel, verses 28 to 34. It's the Gospel for Friday of the third week of Lent. St. Mark writes, One of the scribes, seeing how well Jesus had answered them, asked him which was the first of all the commandments. Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is the only God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with your whole soul, with all your mind, and with your whole strength. This is the first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The scribe said to him, well spoken, Master, what you have said is true. There is only one God. There is no other besides Him. He is to be loved with one's whole heart, all one's understanding, one's whole soul, and all one's strength. We are to love our neighbour as ourself. This is a greater thing than all the holocausts and sacrifices. Jesus seeing that he had answered wisely, said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared ask him any more questions. That's from Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. And what does it suggest to us? Well, you know, many years back I came across a book which I bought entitled Giants of God. It consisted of biographies of various great Christian leaders since the Reformation, especially in England. They were, in their way, giants of God, in that they loomed large in their religious influence and achieved considerable visible results. But the impression given by the very title and by the subjects, the persons, who, were fe who featured in the chapters, was that God's giants are only persons of unusual talents and great influence over the course of religious affairs. Such giants might be the likes of Hooker, Andrews, Wesley, Wilberforce, and others like them. But the question is, what of the little persons, the little person of ordinary natural talents and influence. Is there any sense in which such a person can be a giant of God? There most certainly is, and our Gospel passage today gives us the key to it. God wants us to do good work for Him, and those endowed with, with, by Him with exceptional gifts and capacities have the ability to do extraordinary work for Him. But, consider the first of the commandments that our Lord spoke of. It is not that we do work for God that stands out beyond the ordinary. The first work that God wants us to do for Him is to love Him. He also wants us to love our neighbour as ourselves. One of the scribes, seeing how well Jesus had answered him, asked him, answered the people who were speaking to him, that is, asked him which was the first of all the commandments. And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is the only God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with your whole soul, with your whole mind, and with your whole strength. This is the first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. This, then, is what God seeks from us above all. Love. And this is something which, by the help of grace, only we can give. And, when it, and which, when it informs all that we do, gives to all our work for God, a beauty beyond compare. 
Of course, any love for God will depend on our faith in Him and His Word. Our love will be the expression of our faith in Him, just as it will be the expression of our hope in Him. In the Gospel of St. John, the crowds ask our Lord what the work is that God expects of them. And our Lord replies that the work of God is to believe in the one He has sent. That's chapter 6. This belief in Jesus is the foundation of our love for Him who is the Son of God. So the greatest work we can do in life is to believe in Jesus totally and to love Him with all our mind, heart, soul and strength. In this sense, a humble and obscure Christian, indeed a humble and ob obscure Carmelite nun, can be a giant of God in the depths of her soul. And that is precisely what St. Therese of Lisieux was towards the end of the 19th century in France. It is this spiritual greatness that God is seeking, not just in the few, but in all of his disciples. The Church teaches that all of Christ's faithful are called to holiness of life and to a share in the Church's mission. By their baptism, they are called to it, and they are endowed with the, with the gifts of grace that make it possible. What is needed is the will to do it and the light to follow the right way. Furthermore, this love for God, which should be total, does not operate in a vacuum. It is the driving force of our daily work. In this sense, the daily work of the Christian can sanctify him, and others of course. His love for Christ, nourished by the Word of God and by the sacraments, is expressed in and augmented by the daily work which the providence of God and his vocation in life calls him to do. The humble tradesman, the ordinary housewife and mother, the office worker, whoever it is, from the highest to the lowest, is called to sanctify his work by investing it with all the faith, hope and especially all the love of which he is capable. He is to love God with all his heart in his daily work, endeavouring to fulfil all the duties of his state in life as well as possible out of love. His work might be unnoticed by others, but the faith and love present in it makes of him God's giant. Let us take to heart Christ's words about the first of all the commandments, which is that we love God with all our heart and soul and our neighbour as ourself. This is the work of life par excellence, and it is a work that is to inform all other work that we do. God wants us to be aiming at perfection, the perfection of love for Him and for our neighbour. All who have the foundation of faith can with great realism aim at this, remembering that it's not just a vague ideal. It is God's command 